Welcome to the Film Slate Magazine podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and host of today's show. Today I'm interviewing writer, director, and one of the original jerky boys, Kamel Ahmed. He recently completed a feature film called Laugh, Kill, or Laugh, starring William Forsythe. Here is the interview. Welcome, Kamel, to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. I just want to touch briefly on your sort of transition. This is the first thing that, that occurred to me as um, as I watched the movie and, and learned about your, your recent movie, um, Laugh, Killer Laugh. How did you make the transition from Jerky Boys to being a writer, director, producer? Um, was that something you always wanted to do? And just maybe just give us a little brief history on kind of how you made the transition from really performer to writer, director, producer. Okay, when I was seven, uh, I had a cousin that was maybe about five years older than me. And we would go to Times Square. Now, you're talking about 1973, 1974. And I was so little, we would go to Times Square, and that's when before all the movie theaters were all uh, porno. It was like it, it's, it had all these, you know, all the grindhouse stuff. And mm -hmm. I was so little that when we go to the box office, the lady would say, hey, he can't come in here. He's just a little kid. And my cousin would say, oh, I'm babysitting him. And they'd say, oh, okay, you can come in. So <laughs> I got to see all these great movies, like these movies that are like classics now, like these grindhouse movies, like everything. I saw all the Bruce Lee stuff. I saw all the black exploitation. I saw all the mafia movies. I, I saw everything as a kid. And as I was growing up, I I just always uh, loved the, those kind of movies, and I would always, you know, think in, that, in those terms. You know, I got into music, I got into all these things, but filmmaking was always something I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And the Jerky Boy thing kind of happened as an accident, and I only wanted to pursue a record contract with the Jerky Boys only to push my music career. But when that huh. was going anywhere and the, and, the, and the comedy got stale, I, I was always into the directing, and uh, what really got me into it more than anything else was right about the time the Jerky Boys got big, I, I, I moved to Hell's Kitchen, uh, and there was this uh, building that near my house that a lot of actors lived in, and I would be sitting with these guys that were about 10 years older than me, mm -hmm. and and these these guys would always be talking about, uh, oh, I should have did this when I was younger, or I could have did that, I would have did this, you know, but they, they never did. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I said in my head, like, you know, I'm young enough, let me let me, uh, let me me get into this. Let, let me just, like, make a movie. You know, and this was before, you know, you know, digital cameras were around and, I mean, you know, the way digital cameras are around now where yeah. you make a movie relatively cheap. And, uh, you know, I, I, I got into it. I wrote my first script, and uh, God has a rap sheet. Well, actually, I, I wrote a couple of others before that, but uh, they never never went anywhere. But God has a rap sheet was the first serious uh, script that I wrote that I, I felt really showed my, my style that I'm following right now. That's where mm -hmm. I found my voice. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's and I think that's actually a great setup to your 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 recent film. So let's dig into um, Laugh Killer Laugh, starring William, William Forsythe. Maybe to start out, maybe you can give us a quick pitch or just a logline of the film for people that maybe haven't seen the film or or haven't seen the trailer yet. Uh, Laugh Killer Laugh is the story about a a a very bizarre person who uh, grew up you know, uh, being brutalized by a headmaster and uh, doesn't really seem to enjoy life, you know, obviously from his background and uh, just through a matter of events, you know, just has a, uh, a, a new lease on life in a way, he, you know, an epiphany sort of, and he finally experiences life. Uh, the, 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 all the good things that he, he's never really took time to notice. And then uh, it, it, and that comes through uh, meeting a, a young gal, and then ultimately joining a write, creative writing class. That it, it's 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 almost like a therapeutic for him. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, then uh, something dr- dramatic happens where, uh, you know, where he uh, he changes not back to the first way he was, but more like a middle ground. So, you know, he's a person that actually ends up having three personalities in the movie. Like he starts off kind of rough and 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 and, and gruff and uh, you know not much, uh, very introverted, and then he becomes a little bit too extroverted. And, in the third act, he, he becomes like uh, sort of like the way most people are, a little yeah, bit in yeah. the middle. And I think it's important to note that, you know, you say he's an interesting, you know, character. He's a hitman, and that's kind of the conceit of this is sort of a character study of a hitman, correct? Well, you know, it's, you know, it, 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 he's perceived as a hitman, but he really is a, a diamond thief. But he comes across, uh, you know, more like the, uh, you know, the, the, the type of hitman character. But it, at, at, it's a true thing I was trying to get across, he was more like a diamond thief. You know, generally anyone that works for the mob is some kind of yeah. a, some kind of a whack. A whack yeah, yeah, yeah. Guy. And that's what I meant. That's so what I meant I more. He's, he's a mobster. Me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So tell me, where did this sort of idea come from? Where did you get the um, the colonel? And it sounds like you kind of maybe answered that talking about all these movies in the the early 70s that you were watching. Well, no, but, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, I, I've always been a big fan of film noirs and I always wanted to write a film noir, uh, like do a film noir movie. But, you know, the problem is, is that, you know, I, I work on such a low budget that, you know, to recreate that time period, the 40s to the 50s, that's that's like, you know, so much money. So I said, all right, let me keep it like a neo-noir. But mm-hmm. I was always fascinated with a few articles I read about this very rare phenomenon where people through head traumas change personalities so extreme that they're not even recognizable to their own family. Like someone could be real mean and wake, and, and wake up all friendly and nice or the opposite of that. And there's even rare cases where people have woken up and, and spoke different languages and acted like a different nationality. So I said, wouldn't it be interesting if I could combine that kind of film noir sensibility with this really bizarre phenomenon I've been reading about? And that's where Laugh, Kill, a Laugh really, really comes from. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So now take us through your, your writing process. How long does it take you to write a script? And maybe even talk specifically about this one. You know, from, from start to finish, how long do you work on a script like this? Well, what I do first is I, in a, in a notebook, I basically write the story, but not the dialogue. Like, I, I just kind of you know, picture in my head, like how the scenes play out. Mm-hmm. And then like, like then I start writing the screenplay with the dialogue. Now where, where I, you know, where I'm a little bit different than a lot of people is like, I consider myself like a real New York uh, guy from the streets and everything like that. And, and I grew up in very diverse neighborhoods in New York. So I got to really hear colorful dialogue from all types, right? Mm-hmm. And so I write the dialogue in, in that sense. But the the actual original screenplay, The Laugh, Killer, Laugh, was much longer. And it involved the female character much greater. And when I got William Forsythe to come on board, he convinced me to bring the story down to more of a revenge story, you know, kind of, you mm-hmm. know, because Charles Bronson was the guy that I had in mind playing the Frank Stone character. Like I, I pictured Charles Bronson when I was writing the dialogue and everything, obviously he wasn't available. So when <laughs> Forsyth came on board, he convinced me to, to, to bring the script down to make it more of a revenge story where once the female character uh, gets killed, uh, he goes, he goes on a revenge spree. So, uh, but you know, when I, when I write the scripts uh, that I've done, uh, they usually take about a month, maybe 90 days just to, just to write it and maybe two more months to uh, tweak things. Mm -hmm. Uh, I actually, my process is very strange. I actually, when I'm laying down, I, I look up to my ceiling, and I imagine the ceiling as a movie. Like I'm looking at the film like that, you, you know, huh. like that I see in my head, and and uh, and also like you know, I use a lot of things that I see in real life, like uh, like because real life is the best storyteller. Sure, sure. Now tell me. Yeah. 
tell tell me about just your sort of your process on a day to day basis. Do you have like sessions where you write for three hours or six hours, or do you write when you get inspired? What's sort of your just daily process when you're in the in the 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 you know when you're actually writing a script? What's your daily process like? I tell you the the, the t- toughest script I ever wrote, like where it took like about a year, was was uh, my first film I ever did called God Has a Rap Sheet. Mm-hmm. And what was so interesting, I had an apartment in Times Square, or Hell's Kitchen, really. And my window, where the where the computer was, was right level where the street light, the head of you know the the, the light of the street light was, right. And sometimes I would start in the morning where you hear the hustle and bustle outside and and you know it, it, they you you didn't hear cuz you you're so into the writing process that you don't hear these things but you're aware they're somewhere in the background and then i the next thing you know it goes from like cars honking and and all this to like i'd be at the computer so long then all of a sudden when i'd run out of an idea i'm thinking i'd hear the hum of the light i'd hear the hum and it would make me go you realize I've been sitting at this typewriter for like computer for like you know uh, you know like eleven hours without even having huh. a break and stuff like that, and that that's how it goes. And then there's times that uh, completely run out of ideas, and uh, you know I'm just staring at a screen and everything like that. So it it really comes in it, it comes in drips and drabs sometimes. So sometimes you just get on a you're just so full of ideas for a couple of days. Now, I've heard things like, oh, it's always good to start in, in the morning. You have more ideas there. I start any just whenever I'm, you know, nighttime, afternoon, you know. It it, it really, sometimes when I run out of ideas, I, I go out and I just take a walk or go to a bar or go somewhere because sometimes just seeing life, like, inspires you, you know, just mm-hmm. something, you know. Sure. Maybe that's why so many writers over the years have uh, have have, uh, have been known to uh, dabble in uh, <laughs> and, and drink and and, mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff. Maybe to get inspiration. Who knows? I'm not recommending that to people. I'm just saying that's that's how it works for me. Like uh, I use real life. I use imagination. I use. Uh, but I what I try to do is I always try to stay away from. Uh, you know, my work uh, kind of reminding people of someone else's work. I mean, like, when you write a gangster film, obviously most gangster films have the same kind of format, but uh, I I try to, you know, be, I, I feel like, you know, to be more like original and, and everything like that is, is the key for me. Mm-hmm. Sure, sure. Okay, so now let's let's move on. You've got the script written. What was your next step? I mean, you were a producer on this. Obviously, you directed it too. So I assume you were probably involved in raising the money. So maybe take us through that process of you know you have the finished script. You know what do you do next to actually make this thing happen? I tell you, the toughest thing to do is get money off of somebody mm-hmm. because. When they ask the, the question, everyone asks is, "Will I get my money back?" and and all this kind of stuff, you know. And you know, the funny thing about films is there's no f- formula. You could have a movie with the greatest actors on earth, and it doesn't mean the movie's going to be a hit. And you could make a movie with absolutely no names in it, and it could be like a like a like a big success. So it's so hit or miss. So it's so tough to get the money, and it, it really is a very long process. It's it's meetings after meetings with with people that uh, you know that are semi interested in getting involved in a movie to people that own production companies that are totally interested in in making a film. And it's just really a matter of luck and timing, mm-hmm. unless you know you are such a big name that you're bankable just by your name. Like if Quentin Tarantino, you know, wants money to make his, he'll get it because they know he's bankable. But when you're an under the radar guy like myself, you know, it's, it's much tougher to get the money. So it's, it's, I I was fortunate on this one and the last one where I got it relatively quick, but you know, I look at that as more like luck. Yeah. 
Let, let me just dig into that a little bit. So you said, you know, going to these meetings with people that are only halfway interested. Again, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of screenwriters that are listening to this that are just thinking, well, gee, maybe this is the path for me to get my script made. Maybe you can give us just a little bit of, you know, advice and practical, you know, information about how to get some of those meetings. How do you even set up meetings that um, with potential investors? Well, my advice is, because the first movie I made, God Has a Rap Sheet, was more like a art house type of movie. It was something from the heart. It was a story that's like a like kind of tough to sell today's standards, right? Mm-hmm. But I made it, you know, and this was before you have these digital cameras that you could shoot a lot cheaper, you know? But as I got in the business longer, I realized, like, it is called film business. And you have to kind of, until you get more of a name or whatever like that, there, there's certain movies that people are more interested in investing in and taking a risk in. And you just have to find something in yourself to want to make a story like that, want to write a story that is more popular with with people to invest money with, which is, you know, anything from action to horror to, you know, you know, some kind of uh, drama that's, you know, that, that affects people's uh, sensibilities. So, you know, you got to kind of stick with that idea. Of if you want to get people to take you, not take you serious, but, but seriously think about investing with you. Now, where you go to get the meetings and everything like that, I mean, meetings could happen anywhere. You could go to a party where, you know, you're just talking about, hey, I'm a screenwriter and I'm trying to make a film. And there's always someone at a party that, oh, really? I have an uncle that owns a factory and he always wanted to make a movie. You know what I'm Uh saying? There's something like that that happens. Or, you know, but just by going to certain events, you'll get a card from somebody that, you know, says something, something production and everything like that. And, you know, if, if you just if you just network, eventually you'll get a meeting with someone that may want to invest with you. That's all I could offer. You know, I'm not on one of these levels yet where uh, I could drive into the lot of Warner Brothers and speak with you know these real big shots. You know, I'm I'm really like true independent uh, filmmaker. That you know, I'll talk to a guy that owns a pizzeria. That mm-hmm. you know, like you know, that may want to invest. You know, you know, you know, a big, big time guy won't do that. They already, they, they deal with the, uh, with, with, you know, with the true studio heads. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, there's, there's yeah, all yeah. These I mean, that you, you yes. Can have to so do. the. The bottom line is, it's just, it's just about beating the street. I mean, just anybody you can talk to, you just talk it up. Exactly. You've got to be a salesman. It's a little bit of snake oil salesman. It's a little bit of, be- but I'm, I'm very truthful with people. I tell them, if this is all the money you have, do not invest with this. It has to be something you're willing to gamble with. Like if you went to Vegas, mm-hmm. how much money would you be willing to like spend in Vegas? Like, well, why don't you spend it with this movie? Why don't you look at this as the uh, crap table or the or the uh, roulette table? You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So, so that's the best that's the best way I do it. It works for me like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit about getting William Forsythe attached to the movie. I'm curious which came first with a film like this. Did you get him attached to the movie and that help you get the funds? That was something that would impress, you know, potential investors. Or did you get the money and then go to William Forsythe and make an offer? No, what what, what I did was uh, when, I, when I wrote the script, I was picturing Charles Bronson as the lead. Like, like, so I wrote the dialogue and they did really Charles Bronson, the way his personality was in Death Wish. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when that was finished, I said, uh, man, now who the hell can I get to play this? And then I thought of William Forsythe. So when he agreed to do it, uh, you know, if I got the financing, that's when I would tell people, I said, Hey, listen, man, if you, if you give me the money, uh, William Forsythe said he'd do the do this Frank Stone character, so mm-hmm. that that's what really helped that he liked the script. Yeah, yeah. And do you have a previous relationship with him? Maybe walk us through that process. Did you just cold call his agent and and say, "Hey, I got a great project for for him." Would you guys take a look at it, or did you have some sort of previous relationship oh, you know, or connection? 
yeah, believe it or not, uh, the last movie I made, A Thousand Times More Brutal, I wanted him in that movie, and a friend of mine who I actually ended up using in Laugh, Kill, Laugh in a, in a small part, James Lorenz, who was the lead in uh, Frankenhooker, uh, he was at one of those autograph uh, shows where all these celebrities are signing autographs, and Forsyth was sitting right next to him. And uh, he's the one that got uh, uh, William to, uh, you know, get, give me a call. He couldn't do the last movie I made, A Thousand Times More Brutal, so I approached him about this one. Mm -hmm. And uh, same thing with Tom Sizemore. He was supposed to be in the last movie, too, but uh, he couldn't, his scheduling, he couldn't do it. So I ended up using the two of them in this movie. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's talk. Yeah. Go, go ahead. Oh, no, I'm saying it, all, it always helps when you tell an investor, uh, you know, you have some kind of names in, in the film. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk a little bit just briefly about getting a distributor. Did you take this film to film festivals? How did you ultimately, um, you know, find the distributor? Uh, no, I didn't go the film festival route. Uh, ITN Distribution uh, has worked with me for the last couple of films, and mm -hmm. uh, I really love the work that they do. And, uh, you know, they, they've they been working with me. Anything I put out that, you know, I... I you know, I'm I'm in a relationship with them where uh, they they take my film out and and everything like that. So I, I work with IT and I'm I'm lucky in that sense. A lot of people are always on the lookout for uh, somebody to uh, take their uh, project. But uh, we have a great uh, working relationship, and I'm happy with uh, what what has come about with them. Yeah, yeah. And I I'd be curious. Do you? Um since you have a working relationship with them, do you go to them like with this package, you know, okay, I've got William Forsythe, here's the screenplay, it's a kind of a mob, you know, character-driven mob action script. Do you go to that beforehand and they can say, yeah, we could sell this or no, we cannot sell this? Do you get a little bit of feedback before you actually made this movie from the distributor? I, you know what, uh, that only really works. Right now the film business has changed so much because of, so many movies are made now because of the digital camera where you could make a film much cheaper now than when I first got into the business where I shot on 35 millimeter mm -hmm. and not so not, not many people could make a film uh, shot like this. So there's so many more films now that the only movies that get bankable money before you make it, which is, I believe they call it pre-sales is the, like really if you use like the like the one or two percent stars out there that really that are really like blockbuster type names you know like a like a tom cruise or somebody like that you know what i'm saying like mm -hmm. uh the, you know there's so you know like it's you don't really get uh you know money like that anymore you yeah. know unless it's like like one of those like you know one of those names that just a, just the name right there, you could get the money, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, one of the things that I think you said earlier in this interview, which I think is so important for people to understand, you were talking about um, earlier just about, you know, when writing a script, you have to understand that there's certain genres that are going to sell more and that investors are going to be more interested in investing in. So I guess what I'm getting at is kind of where did you get that knowledge? I mean, it seems like it would be a logical place, a relationship with a distributor where the distributor is telling you, you know, no, we're not going to give you maybe any upfront money, but we can tell you that action movies with William Forsythe is something that we can sell. So I'm just curious where you kind of got that, that, you know, knowledge of what, what genres to actually do. Well, you know, it's, 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 it's very simple. You know, it's through trial and error. Like the first movie I made was an art house type of film. And it was really tough to sell. Plus, I had no names in it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, over time you realize, well, you see other movies that other filmmakers, your contemporaries are making that get quick sales. And I started realizing, like, hey, wait a minute, you know, like, uh, you know, horror, action, uh, you know, you know, gangster, crime, like those kind of movies have historically always sold. And and the art house movies don't really sell, but they're they're more from the heart. They're things to do like as more of a heartfelt project. Mm -hmm. And you know, you you learn these things as you move along. And it's, I'm not telling anyone you know not to make the film you want to make, 
Uh, I'm just saying that uh, it, it's just tougher to get deals for films that are, are more like the art house type of film. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, you know, you, you know, I uh, I try to stick with the type of movies that I watch now. Like, I, you know, look, I, my favorite movie of all time is The Godfather. My second mm-hmm. favorite movie is Midnight Cowboy. You know what I'm saying? I guess if uh-huh. Midnight Cowboy came out today, it would be more like an art house type of film. But, mm-hmm. uh, you know, like, uh, you just got to, you, you just, I say do what you want to do. But realize that it also is a business, and and the expectations should come, you know, thinking of like where, where the business is going. And plus, it's cyclical. Like this, the, you know, the, the the distributors tell me all the time, like what's selling, like what's selling this year could be like a could be a like martial arts movies type of movies, but they weren't selling two years ago. You know what I'm saying? But yeah, but yeah. still, like you know, the, there's certain five types of movies uh, like different genres that usually historically sell yeah so it, you gotta it, you're in a weird position you you gotta write what you love to write about but you also have to know you know the the expectations of of uh what you do and how far it'll get sure but sure. I Some... write what you want to write yeah 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 um Sound advice for sure. So maybe you can just tell us how can people see Laugh Killer Laugh? Is it um, going to be available video on demand, Netflix, you know, iTunes? Maybe you can just give us the release date on that if people want to um, check it out. Yes, yeah, so, uh, this April twenty fourth will be. Uh, you could get it a video on demand. It'll be playing in a limited theater release, two theaters in New York and one in Los Angeles. Okay. And uh, uh, you should be able to get it on uh, just about all the available uh, ways to download a movie or rent a movie. Perfect, perfect. I always like to wrap up just um, maybe you, if you are on Twitter or Facebook or have a blog or anything, um, maybe you can just tell us your um, Twitter handle or Facebook page or blog just if people want to kind of follow oh, yeah, along. On, and, on, and uh, doing. Yes, on Facebook it, uh, we have a Laugh Killer Laugh page and also there's a laughkillerlaugh.com uh i didn't do the twitter thing i'm more of a facebook guy okay sounds good i will link to those in the show notes i'll i'll find those and i'll and i'll link all that to the show notes so people can find those easy well you've been very generous with your time this has been a great interview i've really learned a lot um i wish you the best of luck with this film oh thank you so much and i really appreciate it it's it's making movies is really tough but uh you know you're, anyone that makes movies obviously does it because they love it, they love mm-hmm. to do it. And uh, I, it, with me, it's just about the love of making a film. So yeah, yeah. As long as someone likes it, I, I'm happy. Uh, I, I accomplish what I set out to do. For sure, for sure. No, I really enjoyed it. As I said, I watched it a few days ago, and I really enjoyed it. So mission accomplished. Oh, thank you so much, man. Thank you. We'll we'll catch you later. Thank you very much. Okay. Take care. Take care. Bye bye. Also, if you want my free guide, How to Sell a Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address, and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks, along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide, how to write a professional logline and query letter, how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. It really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide week. To wrap things up, I just want to touch on something from today's interview with Kamal. I think I think writing films with a clear market is so important that he touched on that just talking about his early um, film was more of an art house film, something that was much, much harder to sell. And he started to see some of his, you know, other people in the industry. They were they were creating more genre films and they were having an easier time selling it. So that's kind of where he gravitated to. So really listen to what he says, you know, action, horror, mob movies, these seem to have a clear market and the people making these films seem to sell them. And what that translates to as a screenwriter is that because these movies are selling in the marketplace and they're recouping their investment, it means that there's more producers and directors looking for these types of screenplays. One thing I'm noticing from running the the SYS script analysis service is that I'm seeing a disproportionately high number of dramas. Not that you can't sell a drama. Dramas do sometimes 
get made. The interview I did from in last week's podcast was a movie. Um, the, it was a filmmaker who did a movie called See You in Valhalla. That was a drama. In a few weeks, I'm interviewing um, the director of a movie called Echo of Wars. That's a post Civil War drama. So these films can sell. You can make them, and you can you can write the script. You can potentially find producers who want to make them, get them finances. But it's just a much much more uphill battle. It's going to be harder to sell these scripts. There's a there's because there's there's isn't much of, because there isn't much of a market for these drama scripts and there's there's because there isn't much of a market there's not going to be a lot of people looking to buy them but even more importantly there's more writers writing these types of scripts so there's fewer of these movies getting made and there's more of these scripts getting written and that's just you know a supply and demand thing so if you're going to write one of these scripts it's got to be much better than a lot of the other ones just because it's got to stand out there's many there's many 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 more of these scripts getting made than are ever going to be produced whereas if you go down sort of the food chain a little bit at least in like you know maybe like screenwriting you know artistic credibility you go down that to more of these genre films as I said the action the horror the mom movies there's fewer of these movies getting written there's fewer of these movies there's fewer writers writing these movies but there's more of these movies getting made so just look at the math on that I mean what does that say about the chances of you selling your drama versus the chances of you selling you know your your limited location mom movie and and hopefully I am practicing what I'm preaching I've mentioned this on the podcast many times I'm currently writing a limited location mob thriller so a mob action thriller so we'll see if I'm able to sell that over the next couple of years and we'll see if that gets made it's kind of a you know uh, I'm, I'm not just you know sitting here spouting off and telling people to do that I am actually doing that myself so we'll see if it works out for me but really just listen to what Kamel said I mean and think about what I'm saying in terms of you know the odds everything everything in life is is it's kind of a numbers game and it's about improving your numbers and I really believe that um, writing some of these lower budget genre movies with a clear market is going to help you just it's going to help you create um, better odds for yourself and getting some of those first credits getting something optioned if you're just a screenwriter out there in the middle of the nowhere you know working on uh, working on your scripts yourself just getting something optioned starting to talk to some producers that's just going to help your it's going to make you feel like you're actually doing something. It's going to make you feel like you're actually moving in the right direction as opposed to just writing some of these more artistic movies, some of these dramas, constantly sending them in, getting nowhere, and just feeling like you're sort of alone in a box and not really moving forward. Taking a step back, writing some of these movies, that genre movies that have a clearer market and getting sort of in the fray and optioning some stuff and getting on the phone with some producers, all of a sudden it's just going to make you feel like you're not just, you know, wasting your time and that's going to help you improve as a writer and that's going to help you persevere because there's a long, long, this is a long slog. It may take you several years or, or more, a decade. It may take you, you know, numerous years to actually get your career off the, um, off the ground and if you have some small successes along the way that's going to be the fuel that just propels you along and, and makes you feel like you know maybe this isn't maybe I'm not just kidding myself maybe I actually can do this so one and that's kind of one of the things kind of to, to wrap up today that's one of the things I really hope people are getting out of this podcast is that they're seeing the sorts of independent films that are getting produced many of the filmmakers that I talk to and many of the films that I'm talking about on the podcast they're probably not films that most of you ever would have even heard about but yet these films are getting made they're finding audiences and so I just really hope that you go and watch these films and study these films and and figure out you know start to look at go on IMDb Pro and and click through some of these films find them on IMDb Pro click through some of the executive producers some of the, the companies that are involved the distribution companies and start to look at some of those movies maybe start to target some of those companies with your marketing look at some of the, the companies that, that are distributing these things some of them will also be production companies look at some of the other movies that they're producing if they don't produce movies you know just drill down in IMDb Pro start to look at some of these companies that are making these movies these companies are very very open to receiving scripts from outside sources they're not like the studio system where they're getting high level agent and submissions. Some of these production companies are not getting that many submissions. They're not getting the high level, you know, studio level writers submitting to them. So they are more open to, to hearing from screenwriters. And especially if you're really versed in what they're doing and you understand these genre movies, you're watching these movies, you understand what they can do in terms of budget, what they can do in terms of cast that can all help your pitch. You can get these people on the phone. You can meet them at film festivals. You can meet them at film markets and you can just start to build relationships with these sorts of people. Anyway, that's the show. Thank you for listening.